Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're pleased to bring you the final installment of our 2017 webinar series on the topic of Solutions to Reverse Global Warming. My name is Jana Aranda, and I am the President at Engineering for Change. The webinar you're participating in today is sponsored by the Autodesk Foundation and will be archived on our webinars page and on our YouTube channel. Uh, additionally, those who registered will receive a notification of the recording when it's available. E4C members will also receive invitations to our upcoming webinars, which will be on our webinars page if you haven't registered as a member. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the E4C webinar series team at the URL we have listed on the site here, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us today on Twitter, please join the conversation with our hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about engineering for change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities around the globe. Some of these challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news, and thought leadership, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more information, check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's practice using the WebEx platform by telling us where in the world you are. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right hand of your screen, please type in your location. I'll go ahead and kick us off so that everybody can see what I mean. All right. Now, if the chat window is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon on the top right-hand corner. And I already have uh, folks indicating where they are from. We have uh, folks from Milwaukee, Boston, Philadelphia, Nairobi, Fort Collins, Pennsylvania. I see some folks from Tamil Nadu, India, California, all over the United States and abroad, Kashmir, Thank you all for joining us today. It's exciting to see you all here, and I see more folks coming in as we go, so fantastic to have you all here. Thank you. Keep adding your location so we know where you're from. Excellent work on with that chat window. You can use the chat window to share remarks during the webinar. Of course, if you have any technical questions, feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located below the chat, to type in your questions for the presenters. We will take those questions at the end of the webinar. Again, if you don't see that Q&A window, click the Q&A icon on the top right-hand window of the WebEx window. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation. The link is available on this slide. A special note about today's webinar, we may push a little bit past the hour in case we have too many questions, but we'll try to keep it uh, to time as promised. All right, and with this, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our moderator for the webinar, Joe Spiker, the Executive Director of the Autodesk Foundation. Prior to joining Autodesk, 
Uh, Joe was on the founding team of Living Goods, where he spent six years leading operations for the Global Health Organization. He began his career in the banking and finance sector, working with Deutsche Bank and Cambridge Associates. He then spent three years in the Peace Corps in the Philippines and has worked as a consultant for the Economist Intelligence Unit, the World Bank, and Google.org. He earned a master's degree from Columbia University and holds a bachelor's degree from Washington and Lee University. We're so thrilled to have Joe join us, and I'm going to hand it over to Joe to share some insights on how the Autodesk Foundation is working to fight climate change and to introduce our speaker. Welcome, Joe. Thanks, Iana, um, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll keep my, my remarks brief, but uh, uh, because I'm very excited to, uh, to hear from Chad and Drawdown. But uh, for those of you who don't know Autodesk, um, we, um, we are a software company for people who make things. So I'm sure that with this group, uh, most, most folks are familiar with some of our engineering tools. Um, we primarily serve um, the architecture, engineering, and construction market, um, as well as the design and manufacturing market. Um, and we offer some products in civil infrastructure and, and media and entertainment. Um, I represent the Autodesk Foundation, um, and our mandate is to provide uh, support to design and engineering solutions that solve societal challenges. <clears throat> and that manifests in two ways. Um, one is looking at how can we use design and engineering tools uh, to solve for climate change. And the other is looking at um, workforce transitions to prepare for the AI and automation enabled future. So, um, so essentially we do two things. Um, the, uh, uh, the, both on the design and engineering side, we provide not only financial grants, but also software and support to organizations that are using these tools to provide impact. Um, and we also provide software and support to commercial or for-profit organizations that are uh, using design and engineering tools to deliver societal impact. Um, you can learn more about that at autodesk.org, um, as well as Autodesk Sustainability. Um, here's just a brief representation of our portfolio of organizations that we support. It spans the gamut. Um, we focus globally, um, so about 70% of our portfolio is international. With, um, we also focus broadly on the markets where Autodesk, the company, works, so in architecture, engineering, construction, as well as design and manufacturing. Um, I will lastly say that um, we are a proud and excited partner of Drawdown. Uh, Linnell Cameron, the VP of Sustainability here at Autodesk, was a, um, a reviewer of some of the materials for Project Drawdown. And um, we, we use the book here around our offense as a reference and um, are talking about incorporating some of the methodologies that Project Drawdown has pioneered um, in looking at impact. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Chad. Hello, thank you. Oh, this is Chad. Thank you, Joe, for that, uh, for that introduction. Um, yeah, well, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, and thank you, Joe, for, for that introduction to Autodesk. And, uh, um, and thank you, Yana, for uh, allowing us the opportunity to be here today. Engineering is a wonderful organization, and um, we're really excited to be able to present Project Drawdown to you all. I'm just going to start to share my screen now. Great. Thank you. So the starting point, I'd like to just introduce you all to um, what drawdown actually is at that point in time when the concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere begins to decline on a year-to-year -year basis. It's that point when we take out more than we put in. And, you know, the proposition here is rather simple. If we can reduce concentrations of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, we can affect global cooling, essentially reversing anthropogenic global warming restoring the natural carbon cycle, and essentially creating a regenerative 
economy and society in the process. But why is this important? This graph depicts the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere over the past 400,000 years. Now, part of the million of CO2 represents just a unit of measurement of carbon dioxide. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of variation across a hundreds of thousands of year time scale. But the point here is for the past 400,000 years, for most of human history, we have never lived under an atmosphere of more than 300 parts per million. And that's the case in the 1930s, when we broke the threshold, and now we see this steep rise to current level. Most recently this year, it's about 409 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that's just accounting for carbon dioxide. If we include um, other greenhouse gases like methane, uh, fluorinated gases, and nitrous oxide, and convert them to CO2 equivalent, we actually are at a level about 490 parts per million in the atmosphere. And we can actually take this graph, this 400,000 year graph, and extend it backwards, um, extend it backwards for another 400,000 years. And for the past 800,000 years, we still have not breached that threshold of 300 parts per million. So the point here is, if you look at human history, we just simply don't know what it's like to live under that atmosphere. Now, over the past, now over the past decades, science discourse has been focused on stabilizing a certain part per million of particulate matter, or a degree warming deemed acceptable. Now, we've heard about you know, limiting parts per million to 450 um, parts per million, 350 parts per million. We've heard about two degrees warming Celsius, 1.5 degrees warming Celsius. These are targets that have dominated the, um, just as a quick point, it's getting some comments that there are people who can't hear. Yes, okay, good, it is audible. Yeah, I, I, okay, I think it's uh, just occasional for a few folks. Uh, for those of you who didn't, who are having trouble, even though this might not be helpful, please hit stop and then start or try opening up WebEx in the new browser. Thank you so much, Chad, please go on. Sorry, sorry about that. So, but these targets that have dominated the discourse of around climate change and global warming are based on a premise of an existential threat to humanity by 2100. Now, humanity, though, has not really evolved to understand long-term existential threats, right? So, built on these targets, we have to achieve a two-degree warming, a 1.5-degree warming, or else, that's the premise around these targets, or else by 2100, we can have social, economic, and ecological collapse. But if we're a species that can't really think in terms of those long-term existential threats, it's very hard for us. We could hardly be capable of planning three to five years in advance. And with technology today, we have a hard enough time thinking about six months into the future. So these targets, you know, um, in addition to the, 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 the sort of the existential threat, the long-term thing that we're hard to, to grasp, the targets have a large degree of uncertainty built around them. Now, they are, there's a tremendous amount of good science built around the modeling that goes into um, these estimates of, to achieve two degree warming and 1.5 degree warming. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has done a fantastic job, one of the greatest scientific uh, endeavors in human history. But built into this assessment is a, huge, a large range of uncertainty um, built around these, these estimations. And it's because these are complex models and allow us, they allow us to uh, estimate potential impacts, but the only certainty we really know of its models is they're going to be wrong. Um, you know, it, 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 the prior challenge here is that when we start to model uh, uh, the interaction between temperature rise and concentrations, there is a lot of variability there, a lot of complexity. And we map that to climate modeling, there's a lot of complexity and variability there. And then in turn, we kind of, we map these onto social, economic, and ecological models. And needless to say, these themselves are complex variable systems. What we can say with confidence, however, is that four degrees warming is better than six. Two degrees is better than four, and 1.5 is frankly, better than two degrees, right? That's what we know as confidence built around these. But 
are these goals, are these targets that are built around existential threat that we can't understand, that are built around certainty, uncertainty, are these kind of goals that we need to set for humanity in order to envision the future that we want? And we think at Project Drawdown that we need to set a different kind of goal, a goal that can systematically reverse global warming caused by anthropogenic emissions. And along the way, we are on 1.5 degree trajectories but we don't say stop there. We don't say stabilize at that point. We say, let's go beyond. Let's go beyond that to restore the natural carbon cycle. And this we find to be engaging and empowers people from all, um, from all levels of agency. Because the people we're asking to make the changes we need are homeowners, building owners, their businesses, investors, policymakers. They are inherently a group of risk averse um, short-term thinking, and we're asking them to think long-term about existential threats, that high degree of uncertainty. But we change that discourse, if we can change the goal, name the goal that we want, name the vision of the future that we actually want, and get us there. It is, is it aspirational? Is it optimistic? Yes, but that's exactly what we need to mobilize the broadest segment of society in order to make the changes that we need. And why is this really important? Because, well, how do we get the news about global warming and climate change today? We are increasingly inundated with news of doom and gloom. We have headlines that are terrifying and images that are horrific. Now, this is a Photoshop image. Do not worry. This is, this is a picture of London. It is not flooding right now. This is Photoshop. It is crafted. It's a crafted image in order to incite fear and disillusionment. And we look at this, and what is human nature is to be distracted, to run away from what things that were, from the fear, from the disillusionment. We run away. We get easily distracted. And so presented next to it is clickbait. Who wouldn't want to know how a wife used a frog ornament to, to, uh, to, to, to murder her husband? It's easily able to be redirected and shift our, 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 our attention to something different. The apocalypse is upon us now of biblical proportions. Now, this is really important because this is actually derived from a very good paper from the New York Times, a very good article. But again, it's taking a really good content, rebranding it, reframing it, creating a stark, terrifying image and saying there's nothing you can do about it. It is, a, it is a threat, an existential threat of biblical proportions. So you might as well order takeaway from Grubhub and order some discounted wine. Now, adding together this fear, this empowerment, and confusion over the targets and the goals that is perpetuated by the clerk climate discourse, this results in apathy, an indifference to the status quo, a characterization that has been part of the uh, increasingly growing um, uh, in, in all of our perception of what we can actually do to make a difference, an indifference, an apathy. Now, as we know from social science, from history, from political science, fear has been an organizing principle behind oppression. But optimism and opportunity is a guiding light to making change. And that is what Project Drawdown was founded for. It was founded to counter this prevailing sentiment and reframe the conversation um, from confusion of their targets that are threatening um, uh, uh, and, and changing the nature of the presentation of the message from fear and apathy to one of opportunity, understanding, and optimism. We feel if global warming is happening to us, we become victims. There's nothing we can do about it. However, if, we, if global warming is happening for us, all right, it's an opportunity to make change. This is, can be a turning point for humanity. And we need to make this shift. We need to make it now. There's an urgency. But we have the tools to do so. So it's not just positive thinking and messaging. It is also about... Um, uh, um, uh, providing the tool, providing the understanding around solution technologies and practices that can actually achieve this result. And so Project Run is not only a communications organization to put out this message, to create this uh, uh, counter 
sentiment to, to fear and apathy. But it is also a living research program that rests on the foundation of data-driven, credible information around solutions to reverse global warming. And it is a coalition of researchers. It is a collaborative effort. Okay? We believe that the age of the hero is over, and the only way we can make the changes we need around the world today for an issue as, as pervasive, the challenge that exacerbates all other challenges, global warming, we need a full collaborative effort to do so. And so we've assembled a global coalition of researchers, policymakers, business leaders, implementers who are researching, assembling, modeling, and amplifying the best available information on solutions to global warming. And over the past three years, we've enlisted over 65 researchers from around the world. This is just a smattering of them, all right? There's many more. And we see this group of fellows, research fellows, as a next generation of climate leaders. Nearly 50% have PhDs and all have one or more advanced degree. They come from backgrounds in science and business, architecture, policy analysis, forestry, engineering, uh, agriculture, international development, law. These are not just a group of data scientists, modelers, um, and climate wonks. So we do love data and we love modeling, all of us. But we really wanted to bring a collection of perspectives, a diversity of experience, diversity of knowledge and, that can make this a truly collaborative research model, bringing in all of those different perspectives to bear on this question of how to reverse global warming. We've also brought on a coalition of over 130 advisors. And these are counting every week we bring on a new thought leader, philanthropist, investor, business leader, scientist, policymaker. This is, again, just a small group of the 130 that we brought together. Now, these advisors are actively engaged. They provide expert review of our research and communication tools, and they become, they lend their voices as speakers and ambassadors of Drawdown. Former Governor Martin O'Malley just taught a class at the University of Maryland where he spoke and, and had an entire module on, on Drawdown. It is going out to the world through this uh, amazing collection of researchers and advisors. Uh, together, this living, collaborative research and communication efforts comprises over 200 individuals. But, but what are we all doing, precisely? Well, Project Drawdown set out an ambitious task of determining whether Drawdown was not only possible, but financially feasible. Now, uh, there are many global systems models that evaluate you know, possible mitigation pathways. Um, we've mentioned a few from the IPCC, for example, from the International Energy Agency, many are doing this uh, really great work, but it's kind of a very kind of bottom-up, solutions-oriented approach. And fewer still had a comprehensive approach that included land use solutions, arguably the only way we know with confidence to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Now, so to achieve our aim that would be meaningful to many levels of agency, we realized we needed to build our own systems model or I should say system models. Um, and over the past three years, uh, our research fellows have been working to collect and analyze thousands of data points, developing over 80 solution-specific models and accompanying technical reports. And this material represents tens of thousands of person hours and is built on the core premise of uh, collecting and assembling the best available information from peer-reviewed and reliable sources out there. Now, since this is a, um, I assume many of you are an engineering crowd, um, you might also uh, be uh, fans of, of, of models and methodologies. So I'm going to go through uh, briefly over um, some of the approach, sort of open up the, um, the, the hood of the car to take a sneak peek at what the engine looks like. And we're not going to go into the mechanics of it, but you know, just to get a, a broad uh, view of what we're doing to come up with uh, uh, the, the results um, for our study here. Um, and so what we had to do is develop three core model structures. There are essentially three ways, I should say, three mechanisms through which we can uh, affect uh, uh, to reduce emissions and reduce concentrations of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. 
The first mechanism is through replacing existing uh, fossil fuel-based energy generation with clean, renewable sources and the enabling technology um, to allow that to reach um, uh, to, to allow that to reach up to, uh, to full potential. And the second mechanism is to reduce uh, consumption um, through technological efficiencies and behavior change. And the third is to biosequester carbon um, through plants' biomass and soils through a process we all know called photosynthesis. So we had to build these three model structures to accommodate these different kinds of mechanisms through which this can occur. The first model we built was the reduction replacement solutions model. Now this focuses on the energy and energy efficiency solutions. Here we uh, created a model that, that evaluates a total addressable global market for functional demand. Um, so what this is essentially doing is looking at, for example, um, uh, uh, the market for terawatt hours of electricity generation, the electricity generation market. And within that market, we compare uh, a solution, for example, geothermal energy, which competes with an existing fossil fuel-based uh, uh, energy generation, such as natural gas fire plants. And uh, similarly, um, when we think about a total disposable market for nuclear waste management, we think about how recycling competes with landfilling within that market of functional demand. The second model that we've had to build was a land use solutions model. Now, this is because the allocation of the world's land types functions in a very different way than markets do. And so we created a, a model based on agroecological zones and thermal moisture regimes that create constraints and boundaries around different biophysical conditions that, that are suitable to different practices. And we can, again, our RS model clear a solution to a existing um, uh, uh, high emitting practice. And the third core model that we have to build is a food system model. Now this is an integrated supply side solutions um, uh, uh, demand side, uh, integrated supply and demand side solutions based on country scale consumption patterns. And so this is a model in which we evaluate over 450,000 data points from country specific uh, patterns around different commodities um, and connect this to a uh, uh, supply side yield model that allows us to evaluate what are the needs for humanity in the future in terms of its, its food consumption. And where throughout this entire, uh, each one of these core models compares a high growth scenario with a solution compared to a relatively low reference adoption. We use sources throughout um, uh, a variety of, of sources to uh, create a meta-analysis around each input and each adoption trajectory that we take. Sources that include the IEA, International Energy Agency, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, United States Energy, Agency, the US EPA, ICCT, et cetera, the World Bank. Peer reviewed, reliable sources come in and uh, we, we, we create boundaries using statistical evaluation so that all of our inputs, all of our inputs and adoption cases are bounded by existing sources. And so we have, by and large, a conservative approach to all of our modeling. Um, and as I said earlier, each solution is compared to a relatively, uh, sorry, compared to a conventionally, a conventional high emitting option. Again, this is something like uh, recycling compared to landfilling, geothermal compared to fossil fuel based energy generation. And, um, you know, these adoption projections are used to estimate both the emissions and the financial impacts, which are the, the core results that we present. We evaluate each of these adoption uh, cases, um, assuming a vigorously, um, reasonably vigorous adoption pathway, so they're bounded by what is realistic, um, possible. We evaluate, we create three different uh, scenarios, a plausible scenario, a drawdown, and an optimum. The plausible scenario is vigorous, but reasonably adopted over time. It is our most conservative. It is what is presented on our, on our most of our work. Um, and we wanted to err on the side of conservative. We wanted to say, this is the at least case, at least what we can do. The drawdown scenario actually is optimized to achieve drawdown by 2050. And again, drawdown is that point where we systematically reverse 
sorry, systematically reduce uh, uh, concentrations of, of greenhouse gases on a year-to-year -year basis. And the optimum scenario, what we call is our fairy tale uh, case. This is where we replace all existing conventional high-emitting technologies with um, uh, solutions, with technologies and practices that can reverse global warming in the long run. And we have to integrate these solutions to a system because what we're dealing with is not just isolated solutions working separately, but all these solutions fit within um, uh, both bounded systems, for example, based on the markets of electricity generation or based on certain land types, um, but they're also, uh, um, you know, within a system of systems because they intersect together, right? When we think about energy, when we think about land use, when we think about transportation, we think about materials, all these are actually, many of these are intersecting with each other. So it's a system of systems, right? And so we have to integrate these to ensure we avoid double counting, account for uh, uh, system dynamics and interaction effects, um, and, and uh, uh, really be cognizant of that market alignment and, and allocation. Now, I'm quickly going to go through some of the schematics that we've used just to give you a sense of how these different solutions are intersecting. And what we see here is our transportation um, uh, schematic here. And we see, you know, there's difference between freight and intercity trips, commuting trips, urban trips. And there are so many intersecting points that we have to count, account for, map out, those interactions to ensure that we are uh, appropriately uh, integrating the system. Here's our schematic for, for buildings. Again, it's the, the, it's the input into the building energy use, the different type of systems in a building, and then again, how, how do you impact uh, um, other, other systems? Uh, here is our, our land use system. And again, what we're seeing here is the interaction between different land types the types of solutions that are uh, appropriate to those land types and how they intersect with other systems like materials and waste diversion, renewable energy infrastructure, um, and of course, um, and of course, uh, um, there's other things that they're connecting to as well in terms of transportation, uh, etc. So we have to think about these different um, uh, ways in which um, all of these systems are intersecting. Here's our, 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 our waste model schematic. And again, this is a good one because as we can see, we see you know, food production, how it is affected by diet and, and food waste and the creation of bioplastics. We have to fractionate the different types of uh, municipal solid waste into organics, plastics, and other types of, uh, of waste. And then those are our, become a feedstock into other uh, solutions that then uh, in turn become feedstocks into uh, solutions down the chain. So the reason I want to show this to you is not to, either, not to get too deeply involved in this, but just to show there's a lot that went into this assessment. We had to think about global systems and how all, all of these different components can work together and map out and ensure that our numbers are as conservative as we can to create that at least case. And all of this material, um, all of this material is fed into the results. So this is a methodology that we use to value over well over 100 solutions. And again, what, these, what do these solutions do? They replace existing energy infrastructure, reduce consumption, or buy a sequester carbon uh, from the atmosphere. And we look at over 130 different solutions, and we had a certain set of criteria that we had to use to whittle them down. We had to understand these are existing solutions. We, uh, we, 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 wanted to ensure and to show what the world is doing today, what is available today, um, and how these solutions are currently scaling. Because all of the solutions that we put, all the existing solutions that we present are economically viable. There's a business case to be had. And we had to consider whether or not um, the, the negative externalities outweigh the positive. And if the negative externalities did, we couldn't include that into our, uh, into our assessment. And of course, the core principle, is there enough data to be able to model these technologies at global scale? Now, as I said, we had valued over 130 solutions, and um, we, we brought it down to 80 of the most substantive solutions that fit this criteria. And we also presented some coming attractions. Um, these are solutions or technology practices that are not currently viable. 
that are not necessarily currently um, uh, scaling, or there's just simply not enough data in order to incorporate them into our existing solution um, approach. So we profile these as coming attractions, things that we hope down the line in five years and 10 years, maybe in some cases even further down the line, will uh, have a significant impact on uh, uh, part of that system of solutions working towards reversing aqua warming. And so what we've come up with through this research is 100 solutions to reverse global warming by 2050. This is just a, a, a kind of a poster version of this, um, of our, of our uh, uh, plausible scenario. And all of this research, um, you know, that's the end of the methodology section. Um, happy to dive into more detail uh, to those who are interested. But all of this research, all this collaborative work from 200 research fellows and advisors, et cetera, all are presented in our recent book, Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed for global warming. Now, it's a rather cheeky title, um, but, uh, um, you know, we thought about it long and hard and realized there isn't a, as comprehensive a plan out there to reverse global warming. There just isn't one. And so we felt quite comfortable to put it out there. But this, as you can see, is a New York Times bestseller. It, in a week of being released um, in April of this year, it, it reached that, that list. And, is, and as of October of this year, was back on that list at number seven. Now, this isn't to pat ourselves on the, on the back here. Um, this is a collaborative effort. But the reason um, I think it's been so successful, the way it presents our communications and research organizations, it's a technical manual. It is not, not a, uh, you know, it is not a report of how the assessment of every technology. These are stories around these different technologies and practices. Here is just a skin. Now, here's the, at least one of the solutions, rooftop solar. And um, what this re the way this reads, it's like, it's like a, the kind of book that you could take to the park on a Sunday afternoon and have a good day. It's the kind of a book that you could uh, uh, you know, read before bed and not have a nightmare. And how many books about climate change or global warming can you say that about? Not many, not many. And I think that's really why this has been so successful is that it presents solutions in a very accessible way, but is backed by that rigorous research and methodology that we just quickly, we just quickly went over. And as you can see in the right, top right corner, the rankings and results by 2050, those are the, those are the sort of the synthesis of, uh, of all of that modeling that we've done. Um, and while the models actually produce many more results that are useful for different audiences, we felt we wanted to, to, to really summarize the results in, in, in this, in, a, in just a, it's a few of the key uh, results um, in this in this particular publication. Um, now I'm going to go through a couple of the solutions. Now, this is um, wind turbines offshore. It's ranked number 22 on our list. As you can see, how do we do our rankings? It's based on the total reduced CO2 equivalent. So again, we evaluate uh, methane, fluorinated gases, nitrous oxide, as well as carbon and we convert it into a CO2 uh, equivalent in order to um, add them together and to present these results in this, in this way. Um, and so we rank them based on the total impact in terms of reduced um, uh, CO2 or sequestered um, carbon dioxide. We also look at the net first cost um, and the net operational savings. Now again, all of this is in comparison, as I said earlier, to that reference case, a high adoption versus a reference case. We're always comparing two scenarios here, and this is the net difference. So when we think about the net first cost of $542 billion, what we're really saying is that this is the additional cost compared for, uh, for offshore wind turbines compared to what we would otherwise have to be paying for um, the equivalent amount of electricity uh, capacity um, of fossil fuel-based energy generation. And the same with the net operational savings, $763 billion over uh, a 30-year time frame from 2020 uh, to 2050 is the uh, additional uh, uh, savings um, we would accrue um, from adopting uh, uh, wind turbines, uh, uh, offshore wind turbines. Um, and as you can see here, the math speaks for itself. It is 
you know, over the 30-year time frame, and this is, of course, discounted, um, we have a net benefit. We, it's a net savings over time by, uh, over a fossil fuel generation. Now, the other point I want to I want to raise here is that this image is not photoshopped. We do not craft or create images in order to um, evoke uh, emotions. We use real imagery, real photographs, and it is true we do want to present these uh, technologies and solutions in a different light, in a different way, because we typically see them in a very standard. Um, a standard uh, presentation. For example, rooftop solar. When we think about rooftop solar, the first thing that often comes to mind is an urban environment, perhaps a, a warehouse with, the, with rooftop solar panels on its, on, on its top. Here is um, um, a, 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 a woman uh, who, and a household who lives on a, a, a straw island in Lake Titicaca. We're getting their first rooftop solar panel. Now, it's important for us to think of these solutions in a very different way, right? And also to get out of this notion that all of these technologies and practices are suitable for urbanized, developed countries. When we think about uh, um, you know, rooftop solar, we have to also think about all of these technologies and practices are also applicable in low-income, developing countries, countries, in rural settings. Many of them are very applicable in these, in, in, to these different, um, different environments. And so we have to think outside of the standard model of solutions for urban environments and think about how they apply to other, uh, other, other environments. And this is also a great example of where, um, you know, uh, uh, of why, are, why these solutions are being adopted in the first place. Many times this has nothing to do with global warming. This has to do with energy uh, um, uh, resiliency. Um, abundant energy, uh, a gen energy that can fly to the household in safely. Prior to installing the rooftop solar panel, the uh, family using kerosene for all their energy, their cooking, and for their lighting. Now, the solar panel, they, um, on a straw island of Lake Titicaca, now the solar panel not only provides them with abundant clean energy, but it also provides them safety for their household. So there are many reasons why we should be adopting these solutions, and global warming is often a second or third order benefit. Now, we also have to think outside of just the generation. When we typically think about uh, climate change and mitigation, we think about, um, you know, uh, uh, warming, we think coal, we think oil, we think natural gas. We have to step out of that and start thinking beyond electricity generation um, and, 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 and transportation as a sector that accounts for nearly 14% of global emissions. It is uh, a sector that has the potential to have to be really, to really shift because these are where everyone has individual choice to make. It's about how we all get around cho mobility choices, walking, biking, mass transit, using electric bikes, using uh, um, bikes, uh, uh, conventional bikes. Um, and the choices we make in driving, whether it's a hybrid or an EV electric vehicle, we can make these choices. Every consumer can make the choice in, in our in our day to day lives. And um, it's not only choices that we can make as individuals, but it's also choices that um, uh, can that is cross agency. So this is also about you know municipalities that can plan more walkable neighborhoods, bike infrastructure. Um, um, as well as commuters opting to share rides or bike to work. So this is incredibly important um, to think beyond just electricity generation. And you know, um, technology itself uh, has, can enable new ways of doing business, like what we're as what we're doing right now. Telephone. We all uh, um, um, logging in to a to a platform that allows us to communicate um, over long distance distances instead of flying all over the world for business meetings or for conferences, we can use internet-based communication to work together without ever leaving our office and home. Um, and this is what telepresence essentially is doing. It's looking at the difference between uh, the technology, the technology for um, uh, communicating using the internet compared to um, uh, business air travel. And as you can see, not only is there an airplane, 
and uh, but it also actually created 1.3 trillion dollars, which is essentially tickets uh, to on 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 uh, business flights, um, and compared to uh, technology that allow us to make this this happen. So, for example, this is a staff member from. Uh, Pricewater, uh, House Coopers in, in Toronto and, uh, a team member in Prague. And these, a lot of this technology is, uh, you know, allows for the experience of conducting business in a very, very, very familiar way. So this, 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 this device can move around the office, can shift and sit down at the business table so you can actually experience, um, uh, as if that person was, 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 was there at the table simulating that experience. And these technologies are advancing, becoming more efficient, more user-friendly. Um, you know, in 10 to 20 years, we can imagine telepresence providing work experience unlike anything we've experienced, um, and all the while reducing emissions. And uh, not only, of course, not only from planes crisscrossing the world, but we can even imagine a future where commuters traveling to and from the office is greatly reduced, and we have a fully uh, immersed, uh, interactive business ex experience um, using um, using uh, something like telepresence, um, and I really do think a lot of these technologies are are advancing and becoming more efficient um, over time. And while we don't model that technological efficiency because we're only modeling what exists today, we can anticipate in the future that these um, that these technologies and practices would have tend to have even greater impact. Now, um, other solutions we also have to think just beyond electricity, generation, materials, buildings, which is sort of the paradigm that we, you know, um, are all familiar with. Um, um, but we have to think beyond this to um, uh, uh, how we produce our food and how we use our land resources. Agriculture, forestry, and land use contribute 24% of global emissions. Um, and so it's a significant source of emissions. Um, and this is from a number of processes. Here we see uh, uh, coastal wetlands. Um, and what we, when we think of coastal wetlands and we think of peatlands and we think of forests, what these are are carbon sinks. The, uh, as we know through, through sort of synthesis, uh, a plant can sequester carbon from the atmosphere and biomass and the soils, soil organic uh, matter. And uh, this essentially creates a sink. A, a, a you have a safeguard uh, to work carbon in your ecosystem. And every time these ecosystems are degraded through deforestation, um, conversion to like, different other land uses, we actually release over time those greenhouse gases, those, those, that carbon that is stored in the soil and the biomass. And so um, uh, the, these, uh, these ecosystems can become a net emitter of greenhouse gases over, over time. So if we can protect our coastal wetlands, not only are we having um, many benefits in terms of livelihoods and, um, uh, uh, and, 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 and flood protection and so on, there are many additional benefits to protecting coastal wetlands besides the intrinsic value. Um, we also are securing and safeguarding that carbon sink. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the 53, uh, 3, 4 gigatons of CO2 protected. So not only are we reducing the uh, emission of 3. Point, uh, uh, essentially 3.2 gigatons over time through degradation, we safeguard, we protect 53 gigatons. And if we think about forest protection, we can, again, avoid 6.2 gigatons of emissions through degradation, but at that, by protecting our world's forests, we can actually safeguard, secure, prevent for perpetuity uh, the, the release of over 896 CO2 equivalent. Now, of course, what is actually stored is carbon, not carbon dioxide. But again, we convert this to carbon dioxide equivalent to see uh, its impact on the overall um, atmospheric concentrations. And we have to think about um, how we use our degraded land. So in tropical forests, our number five solution. What is tropical forest? This is about restoration of degraded land. It's about taking currently degraded lands that are suitable for natural regrowth, protecting them, and allowing them to regrow naturally. And in tropical uh, thermal moisture regimes, um, we see sequestration rates. And what's a sequestration rate? It's the annual rate at which um, uh, 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 a 
certain hectare of land can absorb carbon and biomass in soils. And then tropical forest has one of the highest sequestration rates, um, uh, it, which results in, over time, over the 30-year period, 61 gigatons of reduced CO2. That's all sequestration. That's all bringing down, bringing, uh, uh, down drawing down carbon from the atmosphere. We have to think about how we produce our food. Um, regenerative agriculture. Now, the way we have done, uh, the way we're doing business now focuses on you know, annual cropping, um, uh, tillage, uh, um, synthetic fertilizers, um, and overproduction of our resources, um, of nat natural resources. And what that ends up doing is degrading the land over time. We have um, uh, uh, and where, where, where cropland becomes a net emitter of emissions. But that's not the way we have to do things, right? We don't have to continue to use more and more synthetic fertilizers to, to produce the same amount of yield year after year, which is actually declining over time. We can restore uh, that land using regenerative agricultural practices, things like no tillage or reduced tillage, cover cropping, crop rotation, the use of compost or manure, instead of synthetic and fertilizers, green manure and organic practices. A combination of these, of these different types of, doing, of, 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 of agricultural practices can restore carbon to the soils and produ uh, produce uh, healthy, productive soils, improve water retention, increase yield. Yields are actually higher in regenerative uh, agricultural crop, uh, crop farms. And about regenerative agricultural practices, and many of the solutions that are on this list, uh, particularly when it pertain, particularly pertaining to agriculture, is this is actually the traditional method that we have been using for generations. Um, indigenous peoples are still using this. Smallholder farming around the world are still using regenerative practices, and they're being displaced by modern agricultural practices that are, in, over time, net emitters of greenhouse gases. So many of these projects are about returning to ways of doing business that we know work, that, that, are, that provide productive, healthy, uh, increased yield um, and soil, at the same time um, um, a sequestering carbon. We have to think about the way we produce livestock. You know, livestock covers around 3.3 million hectares, or 25% of the world's land area. It's one of humanity's largest land uses. And uh, modern grazing practices become a net emitter, degrade grasslands, deplete soil organic carbon to produce meat and dairy products for, for a burgeoning consumer demand. And it's only growing, particularly as uh, low-income uh, countries increase their uh, economic um, uh, development, growth, and oftentimes that's uh, that it's accompanied by increased meat consumption. So we're actually, the world today, we, um, we are, are, are consume um, more of a plant-rich diet than, than, than a, a high meat take, but this is gonna change over time. So we have to think about how we are managing our, our livestock. And uh, we do have methods managed manage grazing, which includes controlled intensity and timing of grazing, enclosures of grassland to encourage resting, and other uh, different types of plant and adaptive grazing can, uh, in effect, uh, um, uh, uh, create a net turn uh, grasslands um, from a net emitter to a net sequesterer by shifting to more productive methods of managing um, livestock. Um, and this can offset most, if not all, of the methane produced by livestock. Um, and a good point here to, to, to note is that when we look at the, 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 the results here of 16.34 gigatons of reduced CO2 equivalent, um, uh, from managed grazing, much of most of which is from uh, from sequestration. Um, this is a very conservative number. We evaluated over 48 uh, peer-reviewed data points on different sequestration potential from around the world, and through our meta-analysis approach, we chose an average value. That's what we've done for almost all of the inputs that went into this. We collected as much data as possible. We did a statistical evaluation. We chose an average. We didn't want to choose the high or a low to be an advocate of one approach or another. We chose an average. We feel that's the most conservative approach to take. 
Um, so in theory, this potentially could be much more significant. And certain types of land, um, you can have as high as three tons of carbon sequestered per hectare. That's that sequestration rate. It could be very, very high. But we intentionally choose a smaller value. Now, reduce food waste. Approximately a third of all food produced in the world is not eaten. It is wasted and food emits approximately 8% of world's greenhouse gases. Now, if we were to uh, add it all up together and compare it to different countries, uh, carbon budget is the third largest emitter behind the United States and China, just produce food waste. It's astounding. Now, when we think about this, if we reduce our food waste by 50%, just reduce food waste by 50%, across the board, it's our number three solution, 70 gigatons of reduced CO2. Now, we have to think about where we can make those gains along with supply chain because wastage occurs and also occurs in different places in different regions. When we think about low-income countries, food tends to spoil big production or distribution during the early in the supply chain. And this is due to infrastructure and storage challenges, the technology problems that we can fix. Um, and food is not wasted by consumers in low-income countries. 3% is wasted. 3% um, is wasted um, at the point of consumption. In the developed world, it's the opposite. Almost 20 to 30% of food is wasted at the point of retailing, consumers, um, and restaurants. Right? And most of that ends up in a landfill where it decomposes and emits methane. So this is a consumer choice problem not a technology issue. And so addressing this solution means um, approaching different strategies depending on where we are in the world and where we are along the supply chain. And it can have significant impact. And this is where everyone can have an impact on individual choices we make. Um, our number four solution, the plant-rich diet. So it's not only how we deal with the food we purchase, how we manage the wastage or what we avoid and so on, uh, wasting, it's about what we choose to consume. A plant-rich diet is not about being vegetarian or vegan, um, but about eating a healthy diet. It's in terms of how much we consume overall and particularly how much meat is consumed. And so this also has different dynamics depending on if you're in a low-income or high-income country. Low-income countries have a tendency to be, to be uh, on average, per capita, a, a, a consumption lower than what's considered to be a healthy diet of around 2,200 a day. We consume more than that. And um, low-income countries have consume less meat, high consume more meat, but these dynamics can change over time. And so when we model out plant-rich diet, we have to have all these considerations in mind. We balance it out so that um, a plant-rich diet um, means higher increased daily consumption in low-income countries, lower consumption in high-income countries to balance out as a healthy diet and less meat overall. And if we do this, we can uh, reduce over 66 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. Now, this is coming from two sources, both the reduced food waste and the plant-rich diet. It's coming from uh, avoided agricultural production, right? So it's avoiding the production that we would have to do otherwise uh, in order to produce all this extra food that we're over-consuming and all the extra meat that we're consuming, as well as all that extra food that we're wasting. And so it's about avoiding that production and it's about avoiding deforestation, avoiding the production on land that we would have to extend out in order to feed our whole of the global population now and the population that continues to grow over time. Because the reality is, if we are using a regenerative agricultural system, um, or using many different practices, if we are adopting a plant-rich diet and reducing our food waste, we are producing enough food today to feed our entire global population now and into 2050 as the population grows. Educating girls, um, number six solution on our list. Around the world, nearly 62 million girls are denied the right to attend school. Many of those girls will get married young, have several children, and struggle their whole lives 
provide for them. But we see through studies that girls who um, were provided with equal access and quality education as boys, equal access, it's about universal education, it's about gender parity. And we studies show that, that girls who have that from 12 to 13 years of schooling have dramatically different life outcomes. They, providing equitable resources to, to girls through education results in delayed onset of marriage, smaller family size, economic growth, a different way of, 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 of a life trajectory. Empowering girls to stay in school ultimately increases the uptake of family planning because that is the mechanism through which family size can be reduced and how we actually achieve uh, reductions in uh, emissions is by a smaller population size through family planning. And girls' education increases the uptake of family planning. If we consider the future population trajectories, um, the, the UN median population estimates uh, 9.7 billion people by 2050. The high population is about 10.6 billion. That's a difference of 1.1 billion people on this planet. And um, sorry, that's 10.7 billion in the high scenario and 9.6 billion in the median scenario. That's a difference between 1.1 billion people on this planet. And most of that impact comes from family planning, by increasing the uptake of family planning, increasing the right for men and women to make the choices of when, how, and if they have children by empowering them through gender parity, through choices, through access to health resources, reproductive health, education, etc. And doing so reduces all of that demand for energy, for transportation, for materials, for food, all of the markets and land use, all the things that we consume will be reduced. And that reduction is roughly 120 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. And we cut that right down the middle between family planning and girls' education. Because there's no good way to really understand the differences between um, providing equitable, fair, and universal education for all people and family planning choices. Here are our top 20 solutions. Um, um, number one was rather a surprise. It's refrigerant management. It's not a very exciting solution uh, necessarily, but actually we're quite excited about it. The reason it is so high uh, is because with our refrigerants today, uh, we use uh, hydrofluorocarbons, which are thousands of times more potent than greenhouse gases. And when we dispose of our refrigerators, our air conditioning units, et cetera, they typically get landfilled and leak over time, causing a significant amount of global warming potential, right? Because that's thousands of more potent than, than carbon dioxide. And so if we can, in fact, destroy those uh, refrigerants through uh, uh, appropriate end-of-life processes, which we have a technology to do, we can um, prevent over 89 gigatons of CO2 from entering the atmosphere or CO2 equivalent from entering the atmosphere. And this is conservative. If we include a phase out of hydrofluorocarbons as, uh, as uh, agreed to through the Cabaldi Agreement, um, these reductions can increase from 160 to, some people estimate, over 200 gigatons of CO2 equivalent can be uh, avoided through management of end-of-life resisting refrigerant uh, banks and for phasing out hydrofluorocarbons. So that's our number one solution. Here are here is what do you think of electricity most important set of solutions that we can um, um, uh, the reality is is that there are only five of the uh, electricity uh, solutions are in that top twenty. Um, in fact, the majority of those that are in top fifty are uh, food. Each of top uh, twenty uh, uh, most impactful solutions to uh, uh, to, to achieve a reduction in concentrations of emission of concentrations of gases are related to our choices and what how food is produced, how we consume it, and how uh, how we waste it, and what we try to avoid. So these are these are actions we can all take in what how what we choose to purchase and how we choose to consume. Um, I'm going to we also have profiled 20 coming attractions. Again, these are technologies that are that are up and coming, that are things that are in the pipeline, things that within five, 10, you know, 30 years, I mean, we've been saying hydrogen boron fusion for the past 30 years, it might take another 30 years, but um, once we get there, it could be tremendously impactful. 
building with wood, hyperloops, uh, artificial leaves, um, um, uh, marine permafrost, etc. So here's with the 20 profile. Um, some of the extremely exciting from livestock feed, as far as off the form and cut emissions, uh, methane production in, in, in livestock by up to 90% could be transformative. Right? But what's really important to remember is these come attractions are part of a system of existing solutions. So it's not possible by 2050 with the existing solutions we have? The answer is yes, it is possible. Drawdown can be achieved, but it requires implementations of all of these solutions at global scale. There are no silver bullets or a set of solutions that will get us there. The top solutions take us far along that pathway, but there's no such thing as a small solution. All eight must be vigorously and ambitiously adopted to achieve drawdown. And when coming attractions come online, will fit into this system and, and further. Uh, and further increase the potential to achieve drawdowns sooner, faster, um, um, address the urgency that we need. But many of these um, uh, uh, solutions that are being adopted, as I mentioned earlier, have nothing to do with global warming. They are technologies and prices we would want whether or not global warming was a problem. For most, the benefits of reducing concentrations are second, third, fourth benefit. When you think about RIN, when you think about renewable energy generation, it's about abundant natural energy resilience. Reduce food waste, plant-rich diets, about healthy global population with all people provided enough food and sustenance. Family planning, educating girls, about human rights and gender equality. It's about economic growth and the freedom to make choices. Global warming impacts are far down that chain. Regenerative agriculture, uh, agroforestry, managed grazing. They restore soil health and productivity, improve and urbanize the world's drug biome. Protecting, protecting biodiversity and safeguarding the planetary health. Handling all species is incalculable. But the intrinsic, they also are carbon sinks and can sequester tremendous amounts of carbon. So these are solutions that, sh that, that we would want whether or not, and they're being adopted anyway. They're scaling, and we need to uh, 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 aggressively, ambitiously, optimistically accelerate that adoption and turn a shift our way of doing business, shift our way from exploitation and extraction to regeneration and restoration. And these solutions allow us to go there, allow us there, there are a pathway to not only restore car, the natural carbon cycle and reverse global warming, but create a regenerative economy and regenerative society as a side benefit. So that is Product Drawdown. Those are some of our results. Um, our rankings, what we're, what we're, what we're going to date. Um, I'm going to take a break here. I know I have a little bit over time, but i um, uh, happy to take some questions and comments now um, as well as offline. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, uh, Chad. This has been tremendously informative, and uh, I think we'll all forgive you for getting a bit over time because there are so much rich information that you have shared. Mm -hmm. I'm personally very excited to see that the eCRC webinars are aligned with one of your solutions, the telepresence idea, and that we have this global convening that uh, we have. Uh, today uh, with the opportunity to meet with a lot of people around the world without having to travel to those locations. So with that, I'm going to open up uh, the floor, the virtual floor to some Q&A. Um, and I'm going to kick off with a few things that have already uh, come in in the chat. There's a, actually a healthy chat going on already. So we have here uh, one of our attendees has noted that she's teaching a class in spring of 2018 at MIT called D-Lab, Water, Climate Change, and Health. And um, her co-instructors are an ecologist, an MD, and she's a water engineer. Yay, engineering. We are, uh, they are using Drawdown as one of the required texts for the class. And she's actually curious to see if there are other universities that are currently using Drawdown as a text for the class. I don't know if this is something that you know, Chad, or there's already some uh, chatter about this in our uh, chat space here. But perhaps you might have some examples of other universities. Well, yeah, I mean, there's quite a few um, uh, uh, classes that are, are using Drawdown as a text. Um, uh, and it's not only in higher education, but also secondary school education as well. 
uh, Drawdown, in fact, we've, we've just got news uh, this week that that, uh, that Drawdown is being taught in a number of uh, uh, middle schools and jun junior high schools um, across the U.S., um, which we're quite excited about. So something that's spoken to the uh, 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 instructors and educators as well as um, uh, uh, secondary school education as well. It's really kind of um. interesting. Uh, for that. But there are there are plenty of examples, and and and, and in the interest of time, what I would say is please reach out uh, reach out to me. I'd be happy to connect you with folks. I'm also, in addition to the head of research, I also work as a um, uh, VP of partnerships. Um, so I am uh, we're building a coalition of uh, of uh, uh, of partners and individuals built around the collective impact theme, um, uh, our collective impact model. And uh, one of those things that are coming forth is a higher education is to build up and share resources, the syllabi, uh, 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 presentations, um, instructions, designs, etc., around drawdown that is currently being um, developed by different uh, higher education institutions around the country. So we're going to be building a network, a uh, sharing network, to to uh, to um, promote co-creation, mutual support, and, and, and sharing the learning um, from, from the many people who are teaching Drawdown. So happy to, to, to connect people to that, um, and I suggest you reach out. Fantastic. It's exciting to see that there is that longer-term vision of how to bring this to the classroom. And uh, we certainly encourage all of you to uh, continue to share your examples, and there's some chat going on already around that. So on a practical note, uh, if you can give us a quick, uh, really rapid refresher uh, from the slide, the differentiator between net first cost and net operational savings uh, really quickly. Mm -hmm. So net first cost refers to the cost to implement uh, a technology or practice um, uh, at scale. So um, it's the it's the uh, you know the, the the cost for the implementation, and the difference mm -hmm. here it's a marginal first cost. So it's always going to be the difference between um, what we would be having to build in the reference case in a in a conserve in a ref, conserve reference case compared to the adoption of the solution in the uh, on the high adoption case of the solution, um, in the plausible scenario, for example. So um, when we think about this, this is uh, the additional cost that we would incur um, anyway. So if mm -hmm. we were purchasing a fossil, if we were going to install a, you know, a 10 megawatt coal fire plant, um, we could do that in the business as usual case or the reference case, or we can build a, a, a equivalent 10 megawatt um, a, a solar farm. And so what's the mm -hmm. difference between the costs there? So the first mm -hmm. cost, the net first cost is the additional, and in some cases it's, it's actually less than, it's actually cheaper uh, in the case of uh, uh, solar um, and, 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 and wind, it's increasingly becoming cheaper than, than coal. So mm -hmm. um, we're seeing that's the difference between the first cost. Operational savings is again that difference between say uh, the operation over the life over a, a year um, mm -hmm. uh, of a coal fire plant compared to the operational cost of that solar PV equivalent. And so it's the difference on an annual basis that is cumulative over the 30-year period of study. Um, mm -hmm. So in some cases, again, you have an operational savings. It's basically cheaper to operate on the operating a coal or a natural gas plant uh, over time. And so you get an operational savings. In other cases, it's true that there's sometimes and for example, wave and tidal tends to be more extensive operationally than um, than the uh, 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 a coal fire plant. So you have operational a negative not net operational savings in that case. Uh, but again, it's always in comparison to a conventional technology in the reference mm -hmm. case compared to the uh, solution in the in the um, uh, adoption scenario that we prognosticate. Right, and I imagine that entire equation is well laid out in the book, so I encourage uh, folks to take a look at the book to, to get the exact data. Um, and considering you have engineers in the, on the line here, it's not surprising that they would want to know the nitty-gritty of that equation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we're going to take only a couple more questions just because we are approaching time, and I appreciate everybody for staying a little bit longer. 
Uh, one question came in from Ariens uh, regarding the interrelationship between solutions. Um, as you noted right at the beginning, implementation of one solution will impact the effectiveness of other solutions. How do you take into account the interaction between solutions in your numbers? Yeah, so that's that's a good point. And so um, what we're – well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, how do we deal with the effectiveness of a given solution? Um, I'd love to give I have a, a more particular example for this. But what we do look at is how within certain markets different technologies are competing so that we're constrained, we create boundaries around markets through which different technologies uh, are intersecting. Mm -hmm. um, we – to a, to much to whatever extent is possible, we try to be mapping out um, how uh, the feedstock of one solution can and uh, uh, sorry the output of one solution can feedstock into another and mm -hmm. and so forth. Now there are certain um, you know interactions that we can't effectively model at global scale uh, due to variability and so on. Uh, between different localities, um, but it's important mm -hmm. to note that um, you know we that we try to integrate the system as best we can given the constraints of a global system. Our, our next phase of research um, now I should say our phase one is current the current uh, uh, the current work that we've produced is we consider to be mm -hmm. phase one of the research. Um, it is uh, the question of what if what if we were to achieve this at a global scale by 2050, what could the results be? Um, our next phase of re uh, research is looking at how to um, where we are creating a tech contextually specific model that allows for the uh, application of different data at different scales, um, whether it's a municipality, a locality, uh, a biophysical region, a state, country, etc. And that, when we get into that local dynamics, we're going to be much better able to map out those inter interactions between the, you know, certain effectiveness of technologies when um, uh, uh, being implemented um, concurrently in parallel. Um, but mm -hmm. the global systems models, we had limited capacity to map out every interaction at that at that scale, and um, focused principally on again the the system dynamics between stock uh, and flow, um, and ensuring um, our market and land allocations are bounded, and that solutions that do intersect are are, are not double counting. Um, and a good example for this is you know if we're talking about land use solutions. You could, for example, have multiple practices, regenerative agriculture and tree intercropping, for example, on the same mm -hmm. hectare of land. We intentionally avoided that. So every hectare of land for tree intercropping is isolated to tree intercropping. And, 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 and uh, as a regenerative agriculture, they do not blend, um, though they could. And so we avoid um, trying to get into the business of the interaction effect of those two uh, solutions on the same uh, implementation unit on the same hectare of land, um, which can be quite challenging, and we just simply don't have enough data to understand what the the, the potential is of those those practices are concurrently. Um, mm. So we avoid that by 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 being very discreet about where the implementation occurs. Right, that sounds quite reasonable. So this is going to be the last uh, question, even though we have such a fantastic chat going on. I apologize if we can't get to all your questions, but let's end it on uh, kind of a practical notice um, and uh, an aspirational note. Uh, this listener uh, notes that he is part, or he or she, um, Jack, yes, he's a part of a group of students at Penn State University searching for ventures to pursue in the Kisumu Lake Victoria region of Kenya. Do you have any insight as to which of these solutions could be implementable in a two to five year time period? Which of the 80 solutions can be implementable in a two to five year time period? Mm -hmm. I'm specifically um, looking towards. Well, I mean, that's yeah. a strong question to, to, to ask. So, looking towards Kenya. Well, you know, um, a lot of the uh, uh, agricultural practices um, can be have can be adopted relatively quickly. Uh, many uh, actually have very low initial capital cost, um, uh, particularly comparative to uh, uh, savings over time. And there's about you know uh, a, a three to five year period uh, of transition where the full benefit of shifting to say a regenerative agricultural practice. Um, will be realized, but you will continue to produce uh, yield during that time. 
So, so there are a lot of agricultural conversions uh, to regenerative practices can be three to five years uh, in return. Um, of course, things like the, how we deal with uh, waste and materials, um, our food systems, these are choices we can actually make immediately. They're not something that requires a two to five year time period. It's about how we choose to, uh, to um, manage our waste um, and uh, reduce our waste um, and our consumption patterns. Um, many of these solutions in terms of efficiency, technological efficiencies of the buildings and so forth, these can be uh, also within two to five years. I mean, uh, in many cases, it's about installing LED light mm -hmm. bulbs. Um, so it's about creating a marketplace for mm -hmm. that you can distribute LED light bulbs and then, uh, uh, and, then, and then sort of adopting them immediately. So there's a lot of solutions that can be done in a very short time frame. When you think about mm -hmm. tropical forest restoration, for example, that actually assumes that we are, you know, on day one, we're protecting this land and then leaving it alone to regenerate over time right. uh, through natural regrowth. So again, a lot of these decisions can be done relatively, made relatively quickly. Um, the, 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 uh, some, some of the large utility scale uh, uh, technologies, however, they does require infrastructure to be built. It requires time and so forth mm -hmm. uh, before they're realized. Um, so there, there is potentially a delay um, uh, there that can be that can be had, and depend, particularly for a place uh, like, like like Kenya, um, mm -hmm. where where there are other uh, issues to consider um, that uh, that I am personally not fully aware of. But um, you know, I'm sure there are there are um, there's need for for uh, growth and for uh, you know uh, government regulation to help mm -hmm. feed their as well as consumer choices and business choices. Absolutely. It's very much an ecosystem, and certainly we encourage uh, those listeners who are seeking out solutions to implement to consider the insights that Chad has shared, especially as you look uh, at the, uh, some of the solutions that we present on E4C through our solutions library and through our news and through other webinars. We recently had a really great webinar on microgrids. So do you uh, leverage this newfound knowledge and uh, really rigorous research that has been done by Project Drawdown in informing your decisions around what solutions um, would be worthwhile to pursue in order to affect uh, climate change uh, reversal? So with that, uh, we have gone quite a bit over time, but I, I cannot imagine time better spent than we have today. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we will have the recording of this webinar available soon. Uh, those of you who registered will receive a notification uh, regarding when that recording is available. Um, otherwise, just check back on our site. For those of you seeking PDHs, the code is available on the current slide for you to redeem uh, for that PDH. If we didn't tackle your question or you have other insights you're seeking, please feel free to email us on the address listed on the slide. And with that, I would like to thank Chad. I would like to thank Joe and the Autodesk Foundation team for supporting us in bringing you today's webinar. And I'd like to wish you all season's greetings, a good afternoon, evening, or morning, depending where you're joining us from, and invite you all to become E4C members to get information on our upcoming webinars and more information. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>